All right, Dr. Totten. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Can I call uh, you, Brian? <laughs> yeah, but please, I'm uh, just a lowly master of the arts. Mm. Yeah, you know. But uh, yeah, I, you were, you had already had your PhD when you were on last time, right? Uh, actually, I think either I had just completed it or I was like really close to it. It yeah. was during the pandemic I came on. Yes, which appreciate. Um, Appreciate you taking the time to do that. That was awesome. Uh, oh, that's something to do. Talking to your research. I know, man. You know, it was. Uh, people were a lot more open. Not, not that people aren't open now. Yeah. But um, it was a lot easier to get people to do digital stuff yeah. from like a distance. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, yeah. Uh, it, and now, like, I just, I get fewer messages back because I'll cast the net wide. Uh, like now that I'm not at the college, I have more time. So. Mm -hmm you know, hitting people like yourself up to come on. Right on. Yeah, well, um, so, you know, and then um, it's Marie that got her PhD somewhat recently, correct? Yes, she completed hers in 2021. Uh, she had started the program one year after me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, yeah, so she finished hers up, and uh, she's teaching at the University of Arkansas uh, with me. Um, and it's a great, it's a great university, obviously, uh, flagship of the state, um, brings in... I think over $5 billion a year to the state. Um, R1 University, great football team, right? Mm -hmm. On BYU the other day. Yeah. We, we won't talk about Alabama or yeah. Texas A&M. Yeah, you know, yeah, we'll let it, we'll let it pass. <laughs> um, yeah, so she, she does 20th century politics, uh, women's history, agrarian history, pop culture, stuff like that. Yeah, she um, she has been on um, a couple, you know, her and Will Teague mm -hmm. and Eric Hughes mm -hmm. came on. Yeah. Um, and that's back when, like, things are, like, peak heated. Like, I remember that yeah. there was that rally in Clarksville, like, mm -hmm. the next like the next day. And yeah. I was, like, yeah. when I was talking to them, I was kind of yeah. uncertain uh, about things at that time. Yeah. But anyway. Both, uh, both uh, Will and uh, Eric have now doctors. So they're both Dr. Teague and Dr. Hughes. Yes, yeah, congrats to them. So, yeah, that's all. All three of them have um, kind of uh, you know, completed the program since uh, since he was kind of collaborating cool. with the podcast. So. Right. Yeah, well, um, man, that is. Uh, so, what what is your course load uh, like right now? Like, what uh, what are you able to teach? So, I'm I'm doing an overload this semester. Uh, so that's five courses for the, anyone who doesn't know. Um, a typical instructor teaches what we call a four four, which means mm -hmm. four um, in the spring, four in the fall, and uh, usually it's weighted towards the department's overall uh, needs and goals. And so this semester, I'm teaching mostly uh, World Civilization two, which goes from fifteen hundred onward and uh, U.S. history, uh, which goes um, on the second half from 1877 onward. So that's theoretically the end of Reconstruction. Um, it's in the, um, it's uh, survey levels, so it's mostly freshmen, you know, a couple of sophomores, juniors, every, maybe every once in a while a, a senior who kicked the can down the road. Mm -hmm. And um, it's part of the general education requirement or uh, elective as well. And so the goal of, with higher education is that you want to expose students to as many different uh, fields as possible so that they have at least a broad net to be cast. They have at least some knowledge in every area. It makes them better citizens. And so we only, and I think this is an unfortunate uh, thing, we only require them to take one semester of history or American government, yeah. which I think we could all maybe agree based on where we are in terms of our societal discourse. Uh, maybe a little bit more knowledge of the humanities might be somewhat beneficial to us i i agree like i've thought about that uh quite a bit i mean to be perfectly honest uh, i think everyone could benefit from like U us one and two and Civ one and two mm -hmm. you know what tech has done mm -hmm. and they they began doing this when i was getting my uh masters there mm -hmm. they call it uh, i think it's called 1903 but it's it's the whole us one and two mm -hmm. together yeah yeah you know uh, which, uh, I mean, if you think, like you mentioned Civ two, like mm -hmm. 1500 to present, um, and I've seen different cutoffs for that, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, they're all like within, you know, like 1750, like the Enlightenment. I've seen people use, but I like that 1500. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's the about the cutoff I use as well. But like Civ one, mm -hmm. I, I taught a lot of Civ one, and it's just like prehistory, you know, four billion years ago. So it's, you know. I wish I got to teach it more. Uh, we have a lot of great instructors um, at the U of A who teach uh, the, the, in the first half of that course. But I mean, 
ancient warfare for me is absolutely fascinating. Oh, you see, we kind of got off on a, a tangent about yeah, that last exactly. time. So when I mentioned, yeah. um, it's like, so what do you want to get into? It's like warfare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but military history, um, you know, and we're going to we're going to get into some more current stuff. I'm excited yeah. by uh, yeah. what you were mentioning uh, on the podcast. A couple more questions sure. about uh, your teaching, though. Mm. Like, what's your class size like? It's, uh, it's about 40 students. Um, every once in a while, they'll throw a 120 person one at us, but we get TAs. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's very that's beneficial. Great. Right. And uh, they're usually either a PhD or a master's student. Um, my master's student, who is my TA this semester, um, uh, he uh, does a great job. He does French history as his sort of primary focus. And um, I mean, you know, they show up when we need them to and they, they grade. And usually they're actually a little bit harder graders than we are. And so sometimes we have to come in and ease things up. But it, it's always about the instructor. You know, not everyone is as easy as I am. Not everyone is as hard as I am. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's just how um, we all have our own style that we found works. And I've been doing this 15 years, I guess, now in higher education. You know, um, first with UCF as a graduate student and then uh, working as a grant writer and then a curriculum developer and then back to academia and then, you know, Ph.D. and now just teaching for a living. Uh, also at NWAC because uh, NWAC is great. Okay, yes, yes. You, um, I, I, I remembered, uh, just thought about that like in the last, because we've been talking about podcasting that you had done some adjuncting there and that is like the the community college of the state, I would say, right? They're, I, I think they're a great institution. I, I One, I love community colleges in general. I think that they're a great pathway to get students who would not traditionally go into higher education to get there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a great avenue for people to pick up skills, for high school students to get you know advanced work. And um, I'm just, uh, I, I'm really just impressed with the, the system in general. And I think it works pretty well in here in Arkansas. You're able to get people into the the full system um that and they benefit from it you know they lot they lead great careers after being able to engage in that sort of uh higher learning yeah uh so like one thing you know we were talking about how we collaborated um for the first time kind of during the pandemic mm -hmm. and um you know before we started podcasting it's like hey you know tell me about your setup mm -hmm. and like even when we were talking before uh and i know that uh you know based off of conversations we've had between like you have done podcasting recorded lectures mm -hmm. it's kind of something that i feel like anyone that works in education on any level mm -hmm. is doing much more of even the local uh, high school has a whole virtual mm -hmm. academy option um what do you think uh, like what's the future gonna be like for uh, you know video integration into education is it you know like wh what are your like projections or thoughts on that I mean, so there's there's a couple of levels to that. One is, what does the administration want? And the administration in any institution wants to streamline costs, which means is automate as much as possible, digitize as much as possible. And there are great reasons for that. But at the end of the day, I think that there is uh, there's an art to a in-person lecture conducted by a professional that is able to just enrapture the students and you that can't beat it I, I mean for me it's a high that nothing else can can compare to it's just in the moment seeing their faces and then watching the wheels turn and then the things click and it's like okay they finally got it but certainly if you want to make it in higher education you're going to need to start adapting and mm -hmm. getting into more technology and i find that a lot of the students appreciate as much information as you can give them as in as many different formats as possible. Yeah. And so ideally, and you have to have students get on board with this, but ideally you have them like listen to the stuff you recorded beforehand and give them their, your slides and then you bring them in and you go through the readings and the material together in groups and then you get into discussions and you find that it's just a very interactive way, but it requires work and they're already overworked, they're already overstressed. And uh, it's a lot to ask, but that's when things work the best. Um, mm -hmm. But again, at the end of the day, nothing beats just a traditional lecture, especially when it's material that is, is very high level and hard for uh, people to navigate on their own. Yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, just like a mixed approach too. you know, um, I want to start doing uh, more documentary type uh, projects with the podcast, you yeah. know. Uh, and have have more time to do that, but particularly around like Arkansas history, like mm -hmm. going to like state uh, different sites across the state, parking in Toltec. We've got a bunch of like that would be you know 
25 awesome episodes that you could just go to different Native American sites. You know? I, I think that's an opportunity that, uh, one, I would like to see the state, uh, one, one, entrepreneurs like yourself to lead the way, but also the state has a role in this. And, I mean, there's no reason why we don't have an Arkansas history podcast already, or um, not just through universities, but through private individuals doing things that you're talking mm -hmm. about. There are big uh, organizations out there like the American Battlefield Trust. It is an organization that leads preservation efforts for Civil War and uh, American uh, history battlefields in general. So like mm -hmm. the War of 1812 Revolution, you get it. And unfortunately, they don't have really a presence out here in Arkansas or out in the West. They focus more on like, Virginia and Pennsylvania and Maryland. Wow. And, and, and even Tennessee. I was, I was shocked at the lack of preservation efforts in Tennessee in terms of their battlefields. Like Stones River is... You know, I'm, I'm less smaller than a baseball park here, but whereas you know, if you go up yeah. to Pea Ridge, Pea Ridge is like the best preserved uh, Civil War battlefield. I, I went in, it took photos and drone footage, mm -hmm. and walked all around there yeah. um, somewhat recently. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, go ahead. <clears throat> and I, I was going to say, and the great thing about that is that also opens up opportunities to work with with our uh, with our military branches because you can't beat a staff ride and if you get people doing staff rides through p ridge you get to talk about issues of logistics environment um chain of command you know how to delegate authority because you know, the listeners may not know like a bunch of generals get themselves killed at p ridge because they yeah. don't know how to delegate authority well and then just like the politics mm -hmm. like uh between like sterling price yeah. and mcculloch yeah. Uh, and then it's McCulloch that rides up and, spoiler alert, gets himself killed, right? It's <laughs> yeah. like, what's going on up here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then his second in command does it, and a third in command gets oh, himself man. captured. And it's it's a debacle. It, but again, these the, the point is, is that there are certainly a lot of opportunities where we can use this technology that you've masterfully displayed here. And we can use it not just to geek out about history, but to like teach people like real-world issues of leadership, of, you know, just how the world works and how you can learn from the past to make a better future. Definitely. I mean, so, you know, one thing I've, um, I, I do a lot of audiobook listening, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I was really discouraged at the lack of audiobook uh, or audio versions of textbooks that were available. Mm -hmm. There would always be like an ebook, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I mean, I'm always like sad when like a new book comes out and I like want to want to read it, but there's not an audiobook mm -hmm. version. Uh, you know, what do you think some other mediums? I will say, like, in, like the, that whole bookshelf is martial arts books, and they don't make uh, mar that, that was like an industry when I got into martial arts, right? Um, like, I have just all of these instructional books and then, like, some history books, too, but... Um, and now no no bike belt is making like you get some ebooks, mm -hmm. but it's like all video, mm -hmm. so it's like I feel like everybody is just kind of like make videos, make podcasts. But um, you know, I'm wondering what the future is gonna be. Is it just like yeah, well, you know, whatever content you're tackling, um, it can be you know you could carve it up in all of these different forms, and it's like you know almost like the difference between like TikTok being like. I, I'm not on TikTok, but I has, did start one for the podcast, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna I'm gonna do these little quippets about like Jethro Tull and stuff. But <laughs> anyway, but yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I'm I'm like projecting. I feel like everybody is overly obsessed with just like yeah. video creation, and I, I feel like it's gonna go a lot further than that. Well, I mean, so one, you see just the rise of these smaller documentary websites now that specialize in new forms of documentaries. Like you said, all uh, all uh, video and YouTube clearly has a glut of people on there. TikTok, like you said, mm -hmm. everyone has a podcast now. Everyone and their sister. Um, and with audiobooks, I don't know if the, your uh, audience knows this, but a lot of, one of the biggest problems with audiobooks is it actually, in a lot of ways, does not help the author because their royalties are much smaller. So like Spotify uh, songs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So there's one, a lot of the textbook companies don't want to put that stuff you know, on there because they will lose money. And I, I hate to say this, but textbook companies, they do some good things, but they are also out to make a buck. I've, t I've talked to, to like textbook brokers about it, and it's a, it's a weird conversation mm -hmm. uh, because I'm just like, no, 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 no. You, yeah. I listen to 100 audio books a year, yeah. and you don't even have one I could listen to of your book you want me to use. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but mm -hmm. look at this. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, like I'm, I'm a little old school. So I'm an elder millennial. Like '84 is when I was born. My parents are boomers. '87. You know, so I'm, I'm analog. I love the feel of a book. I have 
wall-to-wall books in my office, both at home and on campus, and uh, picking one up and reading it and making marks in it, notations. I know you can do all that on audiobooks and whatnot, but for the, for me, it's uh, just... See, a like, I, I do that also, but for me, like, what I do that with is history books, Yeah. right? So, like, that whole shelf over there is history books, mm-hmm. this whole shelf is, and then DVDs on the bottom. Yeah. But It's too bad that you, you can't get a shot of that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, Jeff Woods left me like a couple of hundred books that awesome. uh, he's not teaching anymore. He He's out. Yeah. Um, also, my wife's uh, master's advisor was Jeff Woods, and his father, Randall Woods, was her dissertation advisor. Somebody was just, uh, oh, it was uh, one of my students over here, Brad, was uh, saying that um, uh, somebody he knew, like, had, like, gone through and studied with Randall Woods, like, all, like for years, mm-hmm. and uh, was talking about, like, how different, apparently, Randall and Jeff Woods are. Like, character-wise? I, they're, they're both brilliant. I mean, Randall is the master of the lecture. He sits down with no notes. He takes out his old-school cloth maps, just puts wow. them up, sits down, and just, just talks endlessly about international history, diplomatic history, and Vietnam. I mean, he can. I mean, he speaks Vietnamese fluently. Yeah, he'll, he'll give he you has every... a word for that, not using the notes. Woods has told me that. Oh, I and I'm trying to think of what it is. It's like... Uh, like like doing it without a rope or yeah. something some, something like that but um like i mean yeah in because i was talking to woods when i was lecturing like mm-hmm. my third third year in second semester i was like man sometimes like i don't need my notes you know on these like certain parts and you know it's it's weird yeah and i'll be like three pages ahead and and then i you know i have to kind of like he's like yeah my dad does that all the time yeah yeah, yeah. It really interesting though. I mean, it, it, it's a lifetime of training to get to that point, you know. And there are times where I can go without notes, but there are other times where you know, I want to make sure I nail those figures right, and so I'm I'm right there in my laptop looking. But you know, the, the students appreciate when you just pace back and forth and just you're like, oh man, you know, you just, you, they follow you along and everything. So I show them that you're not just some guy who reads out a textbook like their coaches did in high school. Yeah. Oh man, that is such a weird um, pandemic in and of itself. Uh, well, how how did it get to be that way? Well, one, we don't teach history properly in this in this country, and the reason for that is one, people think that anyone can teach history, and so you you have a coach who you need to obviously mold young minds, and you know, sports is an invaluable thing to build young men, young women, and help them mature. That being said, not you need trained professionals who know the material and a lot of the time the coaches have other duties and they throw on a video but i can tell you this semester 100 percent of all my students so that's if i take 40 across you know five classes that's you do the math for me it's everyone has had a coach as a history teacher i did yeah Yeah, for sure uh a couple Mm -hmm. of them uh and or i'll say this is another thing i noticed okay teachers don't make enough money Mm -hmm. so if they get their master's, you're fine. If they get their master's or um, if they become a principal mm-hmm. or both, they get more money. Oh, yeah. yeah. But but then, too, you know, we lose a lot of really valuable teachers mm-hmm. to that track, right? Like, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they're like, yeah, you know, like, they got their licensure, they were teaching, and then I saw them working a second job, and I was just like, and, like, granted, like, I was just teaching for four years and, like, running this business, mm-hmm. and... Like, too much. It was too much. But she's like, you know, I'm thinking about, like, you know, going through this program. So, you know, it would be, like, another 18 months. But, uh, you know, I could do it. And, and, you know, I would get a raise. And, you know, with my student loans being this much. And I was just like, man. But I was like, this is um, a weird thing, too, because... Nobody that's uh, like a- at the admin level is teaching. Mm. You know, they're just like super far removed from the classroom, yeah. and uh, there just, just seems to be a big disconnect there. There is, um, and you know, one. Uh, 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 I keep saying one. I should. There is this remarkable phenomenon where if you want to get more money, you got to go into administration, uh, and there are good reasons for that. Obviously, because it takes a certain skill sets to do it. Not everyone could be a manager. You know that as being a business well, owner. Yeah, and and too, le- d- leaderships in like uh, le- leadership in different industries, mm-hmm. in, in education versus uh, you know in uh, business mm-hmm. in martial arts. Or, you know, like yeah. it, it, there's, I noticed that like uh, that was like when I was in uh, like working at the community college for four years. I was just like thinking about like my leadership style, which is not like I don't think I could go be like CEO of like you know 
some major company, but like I think I do a good job as CEO of this company, <laughs> you know, uh, along with my my wife. Mm. Uh, but you know, I I think about that and like I look at like the leadership structure model, um, and like I was always kind of comparing it, and I was like I could never run my business this way, you know. Well, I, so in education, like, like getting back to the, it, it's it's so funny that we expect one person to do so much because teachers are more than just teachers. They they're also like parents a lot of the times, caregivers. Um, they are they they give in they give so much and we demand so much from them, and give so little back to them. Um, which, you know, at the end of the day, is also a, a cost benefit analysis. It's a it's an issue of taxation. It's an issue of priorities for communities. Um, and you got to mm-hmm. scale it to, to that. But in higher education, what I find is a problem that we expect a person who's been trained to be a historian, let's just say, and then you want to throw them into an administration role, but they've never been trained for that. And so they have to learn mm-hmm. it on the fly. And some of them are really good at it. And others, they're not that great. You know, you, in fact, not all teachers are great teachers. Some sure. of them are amazing researchers and write great books, but you put them in a classroom and it's like listening to. That's a whole, that is it too, yes. Yeah. yeah. So we need to re, I mean, I, we've talked actually about this in the past. We need to reconceptualize how we move people through different levels of, how, of higher education. We really need to think, okay, like you need to bring in the dollars. You're right. You got to bring in the dollars. And the way you do that is you get grants, you write books, you do research. That's awesome. Then you need the teachers on the ground who are getting the high evaluations that are going to pull more kids into the classes, create more majors, mm-hmm. you know, justify that byline that you have to justify every single year to the budget committee. And then you need people who know administration. And you got to it can't just be someone who just, you know, blind leadership out of like let's say computer science department, you know, or business. You need someone who has at least some familiarity with that department, with that topic so that they're not making decisions that hurt the department or miss the point of what higher education is, which Degree, yes, but prepare them for the future. Skills. Yes. Yeah, you know, like it is weird too because um, it is almost like, uh, you know, like what I thought about this with student loans. I have student loans and maybe maybe $20,000 of, of them will be forgiven. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe. I applied for it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I've thought about this a lot and it's like, you know, I acquired skills. Like people would ask me because I, did, I, I didn't, teach at the I started teaching at the college I think three years after I got my master's and um, they're like oh you just got this this degree and you don't even use it Mm -hmm. and I was just like I'm using it right now yeah you know Mm -hmm. but like they you know people it's hard for them to conceptualize And, and like what you're talking about with the value of teachers you know those are elementary school level teachers junior high high school I'm gonna tell you like there there is no value these books aren't here Mm-hmm. We had this professor, David Krieger, and those are his books. And I actually got some of his desk copies mm-hmm. of, like, the one you were talking about, we'll see too, French Revolution. Yeah. Uh, took him for that class uh, and got to um, go in, like, he left all his stuff. Mm-hmm. Left it for Dr. Tarver, as I mentioned earlier. And Dr. Tarver got, uh, got everything he wanted, and then he was like, hey, yeah. you can go in there and get mm-hmm. whatever you want. And I was just like... But, like, he's now passed away. My philosophy professor's now passed away. Mm. In college, Dr. Woods, another guy, mm. like, why I lamented about him not teaching is because the impression he made on me, right? Mm. He was a part of the development of the skills and the, just the level of analysis and critical thought that I apply to, you know, this business and this podcast and every, really everything I do, like he just became, I, I mean, he ended up getting a jujitsu black belt trainer here, yeah. which takes a decade. Right. But this, you know, um, was a major influence on me. All those guys were. And, uh, I kind of feel like, um, there's been this gamble between like, um, you know, loan companies that, mm-hmm. you know, people like you and I are cookie cutter, like, mm-hmm that you can just crank out an army of people, mm. which is one thing I was uh, interested, uh, interesting that uh, Dan Carlin says this. It's like, well, then how come there aren't samurai uh, outside of Japan? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like mm. like anytime we're talking about in history, we're like, yeah, you know, Hannibal, he was great, but he just had to rely on mercenaries, and they're not as good as Romans. 
Yeah, like that's kind of like the the mercenary army's not as good. Sort least, of. Yeah, that's what they would they would tell you. But you know, at the time, they actually were quite effective. And they, I mean, you know, the Ptolemies they had success with mercenaries early on in the dynasty. Of course, of course. I mean, so one of the things that you're talking about is we're pushing teachers away, and it's really sad because here are people who you don't become a teacher because you want to make money. There's no one in America who's making money off of being a teacher unless like you're like Joe Lepore or someone who's super famous who's then, you know, gone off to write really famous books and do, you know, the the media tour. Mm -hmm. But by and large, the person who uh, wants to be a teacher or like friend, like my friends Logan and Amber from back at UCF, University of Central Florida, let's go. Um, and, you know, they loved it and now they aren't teaching anymore because they just can't take the toxicity of the students, of the parents, of the administrators, of the politicians. And it's like, what are we doing? You have this idea out there that you can just stick anyone in a classroom. And so one of the things that they're doing in Florida and in other states is having military people do it, which don't get me wrong. Our veterans are amazing. They deserve better than what we do for them. And while I, I'm com comfortable around these men and women who have honored our country, they're not trained in how to do this. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they'll bring a lot to the classroom in their own way, but you still need to train professionals. It isn't something that we should make, uh, because there's a shortage, mm -hmm. it's not something we should make easier. It's something we should make more rigorous, yes. but, but you know, like in certain ways. So mm -hmm. for example, I know with an education licensure, it's a little different, but when I was getting my, um, uh, just my history degree, mm -hmm. I, I believe it was 66 hours mm -hmm. of non-degree related yeah. electives. Mm -hmm. Like what? Yeah. Like I just got to pay you for this, these yeah. 66 whatevers mm -hmm. and you sign my diploma. <laughs> yeah, but that was kind of weird to me also. And then like uh, what we were talking about earlier, reconfiguring like some of the approaches to gen ed, but you know, ma making it more rigorous for the student, but also like that, that the student is studying to become the teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also, uh, you know, the reason I, I went through phase one of the education program mm -hmm. and just did not student teach. And, um, you know, I was just kind of disenfranchised, like looking like once I did all my observations mm -hmm. at like the high school, I was like, oh, okay, I can't really picture myself doing this guys. Um, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just going to get a master's and maybe, maybe college will be better than mm -hmm. this. It's like, like you said, um, the, the gen eds make sense on paper and I'm entirely behind the program because at the end of the day, like a business major needs to know more than just supply chain economics. Right. I agreed. Um, that being said, sometimes it can go a little too far. Like I remember I had a couple of friends who would take bowling as a class, you know, golf as a class. Are you going to college to really play golf and do bowling? Or are you going to, are you going to put that time into something worthwhile? No hate on anyone who takes that route. Okay. It's just, you know, you're paying the money, make the most of it. And so I just doubled down on history classes because I love history I already. Yeah. Um, so. I got philo history, philosophy, yeah. Yeah. Um, anthropology. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I took classes I wanted to take. So I was appreciative. But here, you know, we are again, like I've ta talked about student loans a couple of times. And, but like, that's not a, it's not a burden for me. Like, I have to pay them back. And like, I've, I, like I said, I feel like I've acquired the skills mm -hmm. that, you know, like the whole agreement is like, you know, you'll get your degree and you'll have these skills and then you can go be a, a Brian or a, a Jeff Woods or, or a whoever and you'll contribute to society and you won't be uh, stricken by poverty unless, you know, something goes wrong, which it probably will. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> but, you know, and that's kind of um, that's, I think, very much of the backdrop of, of where we are uh, right now. So, you know, no, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm following along with you. It's uh. There's no, the thing I tell my students, and actually this is the point of education, is there's no one silver gold bullet that's going to change the world. You know, sometimes ideologies or structures or methods work in one era or with one group of people or in one field, and it doesn't translate to others, mm -hmm. right? So that means that you need to be adaptable, and that takes good leadership and people who are trying to do what's best for others and not just make a quick buck, which, unfortunately, some individuals believe that's the end all be all of society. And you know, more power to you if that's what you want in life, awesome. But personally, I like giving back and I try to encourage others to give back as well. And another thing I'd go, just going off of what you're saying is, you know, just cause you teach history doesn't mean that you can't help build other schools and uh, skills in other fields. So I have my students do digital history projects, you know, get them 
I mean, that, yeah, that's really kind of what I was like, you know, we were dancing around that earlier and kind of mm -hmm. got off on into other topics. Right. But I mean, that's it. Like, that's the sort of skills that mm -hmm. you're going to bring moving forward that right. you, like you're polishing all the time. And that like over the just through this podcast, mm -hmm. like just doing more now, they sound great, but they used to not. Right. You know, you know, <laughs> uh, and it's just like that get, getting your hands dirty and doing it and trusting the process. Mm -hmm. Uh, and following through with something mm -hmm. um, that that's because I, man I didn't see the path I banked hard on it being there and a way came you know it, and it was really interesting to me as it was occurring and then also like after it occurred I tell people this all the time it was the most disappointing thing I've ever experienced I was like oh I've accomplished all of my goals <laughs> we are as creatures need uh, hardship and like and like things to overcome because when everything's easy and you've accomplished everything, like, all right, what now? And and what now? And now you're building this. You have your business. You're building this podcast. You're expanding into other areas, and uh, that's I mean that's the mission. That's the goal in life, right? Is mm -hmm. to continue to strive because you, know, you don't want to get complacent. You know, there's no point in that. You know, cows are complacent. They, they like living in their fields and eating their grass. You know, we're humans. We need more than that. Yeah. Now, and too, like I will just say, um, typically people. And this is not to not to stereotype, but like a lot of folks in the, like the arts and humanities have a knack for like I like creating stuff. Mm. Like it it um it just makes me uh, I don't know just feel fulfillment. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. whether that's a podcast or I have a thousand videos on my gym YouTube yeah. of like all different voiceovers, kids curriculum video, you know, just you name it. Um, and man, I just I really like uh, like this digital form of communication. I, I do feel like it's the future, and um, I'm interested to see what it's like five, ten years down the road. Because like right now, I feel like uh, there is just like a saturation of like everybody's kind of oh I can do this, just you know start putting stuff out, and then they're not putting stuff out, you know. And it is it's a lot to keep up with, uh, but I feel like uh, with where we are with live streaming and everything, like I, I'm just continually dialing things in, and I will live the podcast sometimes, um, because like there's no editing to do, mm. and as long as like n nobody says like transphobic stuff or something, you know, I don't, I'm good. <laughs> no, there's always there's always a danger of going live, and so yeah, you know, and and you know, I worry about it less with. Um, yeah, people like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you never, you never know what someone will pop off and say. Sometimes you'll have the, the a brilliant guy sit down and, or a guy or gal, and then just boom, something just comes out of their mouth and it's like, oh no, <laughs> yeah, it's so happened two or three times. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, uh, but certainly, I mean, things have changed so much in the last ten years already. I'm lost three years. I mean, nine, two, 2019. Not, you know, I could have never predicted what happened with the pandemic, and it's accelerated oh, so man. much change in our country. Um, and honestly, it's also fascinating how little we've changed in the last two years. And I mean, this is maybe getting into a different topic we can deal with later, but I think what the pandemic showed us is that we were living on a knife's edge, that all it takes, and Tom Clancy and other novelists and then uh, ma major strategic thinkers have, have been talking about this loudly for 20 years. If international supply lines shut down for more than a month, people start starving in cities. That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And yet we are all going around trying to get back to where we were in 2019. And it's just fundamentally impossible. Um, Russia and the Ukrainian war, the various other conflicts that are raging across the globe, which no one is aware of at this point, or at least no one gives real attention to in this country, um, they are exacerbating the issues that we've seen uh, with the supply chain. And we are making food in an unsustainable way. We are living in an unsustainable way. We're generating wealth in an unsustainable way. And at some point, we need to come together as a country and have a realistic conversation about, hey, what did the pandemic teach us? It taught us that we need to change the way that we school people sometimes. We need to adapt. We need to change. We need to fundamentally restructure the ways in which we grow our food, eat our food, build our homes, everything. And we're not having those tough conversations. Instead, mm -hmm. we're arguing with I, I children about to say in a that. playroom. <laughs> I know that's so unfortunate. I was like, like literally, while you were saying, I was like, if we could just stop arguing mm -hmm. uh, about, and, and I, I keep saying this on the podcast last few episodes, but it's like, 
oh, we were just about two years out from the next election. And it's like, that's really about the point that I've been projecting. Like, you know, there's more and more Trump rallies that I'm seeing. But like from here moving forward, um, I'm worried about it being tumultuous. Yes. Y yeah. You know, like like it was last time and this would be a great way uh to just kind of jump over into that next topic because uh, yeah i had um a good friend of mine billy reader on the podcast uh somewhat recently his journalism runs the grad program for communications across the street lives on a houseboat in the florida keys that's the dream that's he's, the dream he's a pirate, <laughs> pirate professor look him up he's, he's been on the podcast a few times he's who i went to the battlefield with actually nice, nice. um but, uh, you know, we've talked a couple of times. I was on his podcast, and then he was on here just three weeks ago or something about, you know, what uh, what would, uh, you know, a World War Three type event look like? Are we in a cold World War Three type event? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just like talking, I, even McCool uh, was on somewhat recently, who um, was the other historian mm -hmm. at uh, uh, the community college. But just kind of like looking at things uh, going on and, um, you know, like he was he was making comparisons to like, uh, you know, what you see in like Northern Ireland or mm -hmm. what we have seen in Northern Ireland. But mm -hmm. like, you know, you just mentioned right before the podcast, like, hey, let's let's get into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You know, what is going on over there? Um, I know that's going to be a big thing to unpack, but like particularly, um, you know, what are some differences with what's going on over there mm -hmm. that are um, maybe connected to or driven by the pandemic? Because mm -hmm. um, I know that there are some definite, like with uh, economic uh, food production in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also, like, what, it, you know, we're, we've talked about military history, mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, uh, th that in different cultures in mm -hmm. the past today. You know, what's going on uh, there now? And, like, what are some differences we're seeing in, you know, what is now modern warfare in 2022? That would be my big interest in this topic. Yeah, yeah. So, first, you know, full disclosure, I am not a scholar of modern war, um, but I am a scholar of military history. And so, like, my specialty is the Civil War, early America, the Revolutionary Period. But there are those lessons that you can take away from broader, for, uh, to, to apply broadly. So, you know, issues of logistics, leadership, mm -hmm. force structure, um, political will versus, uh, you know, the, just um, the, the lack of will, I suppose, is a better way to say it. And what we're seeing right now is that uh, it's hard to compare this to anything that we can really draw from. I mean, you, uh, people will go and they'll say, oh, you know, this is kind of like the Spanish Civil War, you know, where General Francisco Franco, he is this fascist and he's getting weapons and training for, and uh, advisors from you know nazi germany and fascist italy and then the uh, republican forces are being funded by the soviet union and they're sending the same group of people and then there's an international brigade with ernest hemingway in it who comes over and it's just this free-for-all training ground for the next big war and you could make that comparison to ukraine absolutely um but there's just so many different levels to it and yes it's tied to lots of broad politics that go back to the you know, fall of the Iron Curtain and the fall of the Soviet Union, promises made and promises lost uh, on part of the United States, the UN, and other groups, opportunities for China to ascend. It's so nuanced and complex, but I suppose what we can at least start with is, why are we here in 2020? And the answer is first Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is a man who is a, was a KGB agent in Germany in the 1980s and 70s. He's a man who said that the fall of the Soviet Union is the single greatest catastrophe that happened in world history. It's a man who pretty much, and we have not exactly confirmed this, but we're pretty sure that he launched a false flag operation in his own territory in order to justify an invasion of Chechnya in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. And then from there, did everything he can to fight the power of the growing EU, NATO, and American dominance worldwide. And he first saw an opportunity, obviously, with Afghanistan and Iraq, which he made sure that our enemies got money, training, and other things sent to them. Uh, from there, he began to push his political goals. And by political or diplomatic goals, what I mean is trying to recreate the Soviet Union and all that name. And the first step of that process was uh, the Chechen Wars and then Georgia. So the mm -hmm. South Ossetian War of 2008, where he saw 
that there was no political will in the United States to do, or the EU for that matter. And Angela Merkel also has a lot, a lot of responsibility for this. Um, no one was really where was going to push back on him, and so we appeased him. And he said, "Okay, I can, I can go further, right? He annexes Crimea, not a word. I mean, there's words, but you know, no one really took it seriously. Then he goes into the, the couple of counties in Ukraine. Okay, still no major pushback. Then we, there are some strategic thinkers in the United States who could begin saying, you know what? We, we need to start upping the game here. We need to start training the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians have technically been at war since 2014. And they, the one, one of the reasons why they're doing so well is one, we've been training them and funding them, but also they have been, engaged, have been rotating out their troops in a professional army way. And what I mean by that is force structure, meaning the way that you organize your forces, whether you have a, an entirely professional army, you have an entirely conscript army, you have a hybrid like the Russians have, which is conscript and contractors. These things determine what you're able to actually do on the battlefield. And what we're seeing is that the Russian army has been largely failing uh, because they went from a pure conscript system with massive mobilization capabilities um, that was dismantled at the end of the Soviet Union because of its sheer size and cost. Mm -hmm. And they then tried to adopt an American-style professional army that absolutely blew up in their faces for various political, social, cultural issues, and money as well. And now they've cobbled together this thing that would kind of work, that kind of worked when they were intervening in Syria and kind of worked when they were doing these small little land grabs in Georgia and Ukraine. But it's fundamentally failed at a larger level to be able to combat a largely professionalized, well-trained, well-supplied, or at least better supplied now, Ukrainian force uh, with the full backing of NATO and the United States, or at least with partial backing of some parts of NATO. Uh, thank you very much, France and Germany, for not doing much. But largely what we're seeing is um, a new... This is gonna. People are gonna be studying this war for a very, very exactly. Long time. It's hard to and it's hard to know what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. So, like, a very humble disclaimer because uh, for of you at the beginning of this conversation, because a lot of people would just say what's going on. Yeah, you know? was, and it's was, like we really don't know. Like, it could be this complex web of things. Mm -hmm. But like what you were saying earlier, it's like no, you know, no one saw. Mm -hmm. uh, the web unwinding at the beginning of World War One, like it did, right. like oh man, yeah. you know, and like looking back and learning, or like you know, people have compared that um, journey of Putin that you just talked about, like Hitler not getting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stopped. There are certainly, I mean, it's so funny how current events slightly change the way you teach. So for a while, I talked about how, you know, maybe we shouldn't be so hard on appeasement, and now I'm like, oh no, no, appeasement's terrible because like look at what, what we did. You know, we've allowed this to happen because of appeasement. But so just to you know, in case anyone's interested. I go and look at um, the writings of professionals in international studies, in, um, in the self-defense or the defense industry. So the people I look at are like Michael Kaufman of, the, uh, of this major uh, center for strategic thinking and the ISW, which is the Institute for the Study of War. And they are, uh, one, they put all the sources up out front. They are well-trained, internationally recognized experts, but they are also... Um, not uh, maybe not humble is the word, but they are circumspect in what they do. They're like, I can tell you about this part of my field, like the thing I'm an expert in, but I'm not willing to tell you more because I don't want to overstep my bounds. And I think that's mm -hmm. always important as whenever you talk to someone who claims to be an expert, like don't you know, you, you trust them for to a point, but when they start you know talking about life, the universe, and everything, and the answer is 42. That was Adam's reference. Um, then that's when you got to pump the brakes. Be like, okay, should I really trust this guy who's on yeah. CNN or Fox News? No, you, you trust the guy who who puts in the guy or gal who puts in the real work, the real study, is an expert on a very sort of minute field, and um, you try and cobble together larger understandings based on that. And so that's sort of the sources I go to, and um, that's especially important in our modern era because. The big thing that we as teachers have to do is like, what are sources? What source is trustworthy? How do you verify? Oh yeah, no. The information, the evidence, right? Well, and you know that's one thing um, with the podcast I'm planning. Um, like the other day, I was making my Egypt bibliography, mm -hmm. or I was updating it, um, and I was making my Enlightenment bibliography because it's like those are classes I had that like. I have, you know, great notes for those classes. It's mm -hmm. like, I'm just going to, you know, the benefit of like having a studio and that podium and all yeah. this cool stuff is yeah. I can just turn that into a podcast. Whereas if I was uh, teaching, I would never get to teach a class over the French Revolution or the Enlightenment. Like, and too, when I left uh, tech, mm 
-hmm. those are two different classes yeah. and they got consolidated into one with the scientific revolution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is like let's just call it civ 2 guys like upper level civ 2 like <laughs> <laughs> it's not but anyway but yeah, yeah i mean it's it it unfortunate that, i'm sure it's you know administrative decisions often unfortunately dictate what you teach or what you don't teach so here's just a little story about academia um for a while, no one wanted to know anything more about the Cold War. People were like, oh, this, it's this, over. this international studies is over. Who needs a Russian professional? Who needs a, you know, a, a modern uh, Europe uh, scholars? Let's all talk about race, class, gender, you know, the, the holy trinity of scholarship now, uh, which is nothing wrong with that scholarship, obviously. But now, because of the invasion, every single job offer I see, besides the, the traditional mm -hmm. ones, are... Experts in Russia, experts in the Euro Europe, expert, you know, because it's now back in the news. And that's, we, we're kind of like, the administrators are in some ways followers. They're like, oh, you don't need that byline, chop it to save money. Wait, you mean you don't have that professional here? We need to give a, we need to give an interview, Go hire them. Like, okay, thanks. Like, that's the reason why we have robust departments so that we can be able to teach lots of different subjects and topics mm -hmm. and be prepared for when something we don't you know, know is going to happen. For instance, like what's going to go on with China and Taiwan? Probably need a couple of Chinese scholars uh, or East Asian scholars on to explain these things to students and uh, the broader public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, I, I, I reached out to him about the same time uh, I first reached out to you, but Mitch Lerner, who's mm -hmm. been on this podcast before, is a... Um, uh, he... Um, I forget the name of the program, but it's at Ohio State. Uh, he 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 was friends with Woods. Mm. That's how I kind of got introduced to him. But he's an expert on North Korea, mm. particularly the Pueblo incident. But he's been on the podcast. I hope he's coming back. Um, but really interesting guy, and he's like, uh, so they have some program for like Asian studies, East Asian studies, and he's like the head of that program. I forget the name, mm. um, but a really awesome historian. He's done some podcasts. It was it was interesting because um, I had this jujitsu guy on my podcast who's an intellectual guy too, mm -hmm. um, and I was talking about Mitch Lerner to him, and I was like, yeah, you know, this guy was on my podcast talking about how like people refuse to want to wear a mask uh, during uh, the Spanish flu, you know, yeah. and he was just like, I've got to have that guy on my podcast, <laughs> and, and then he was next thing I know, Mitch was on that dude's mm -hmm. podcast talking about that sort of stuff but um that's funny you said that I actually assign a a, a, a um, an assignment on that topic so i'm like imagine if we had learned this history before we might be able to like i don't know not repeat it but again yeah. going back to our early conversation about the issues with just education in general but anyway so yeah well it, so again just glad that you are paying attention to what's going on because there are classes of people there's like this class of people that they um don't watch the news mm -hmm. but they somehow claim knowledge to know uh, everything that's going on. Yeah, uh, I I keep up with current events the best that I can as a trained researcher. Yeah, and critical thinker. The news is definitely not a place I go check out. No, um, no. And then too, like, uh, you know, you really have to dig um, to connect the dots these days. It's not as uh, it's not very simple. You got to know where to find. And so, I mean, obviously tracking down where are the experts on a given topic, where are they employed, what's their background, what can we, you know, how, how much uh, can we glean from their, from their insights and then at what point do we have to, you know, kind of reassess. But like you were saying, um, this is an incredibly complex topic that um, is going to be studied for decades. And it is part of the issue is how much information is out there. Imagine having having Twitter with World War II. Yeah. I mean, the amount like people would have been saying, Moscow has been lost, or you know, and when you know, obviously for those of you who don't know, Moscow did not fall during World War II. But Twitter puts so much misinformation out there um, because there are bots, there are people who are propagandists, and we're at this really weird point in history where I have personal friends who are far right and personal friends who are far left, and yet they're talking the same propaganda about how they're like Nazis in Ukraine. I'm like, listen. Nazis are Nazis, and until people are putting people in like boxes and like you know in ovens, basically, we don't get to use that as a term. And I say that as a, the descendant of a Holocaust survivor. It's like you know I, I hate it when people go and automatically. So where where is right that? Like, go into that real quick, if you don't mind. Like, sure. what do you know about Nazis in in, in Ukraine? Like, so basically, one of the in every single society in human existence, you are going to have people on various political spectrums, and there are always going to be rabid anti-Semites in any society. 
And they, one of the groups who began fighting the Russians were militia units which could claim to have a lot of neo-Nazis or far-right anti-Semites in it, however you want to describe what they are. But they're not like actual Nazis. They're not adherents of Hitler who are, who are killing Jews. They're just wannabe cosplayers, right? But they're the guys in Ukraine at first who were fighting. Um, and then from there, this led to this myth that Russia sort of was able to peddle that the only people who are fighting them are far-right neo-Nazi anti-Semites, right? And so they've turned this into a massive sort of, the, whenever Russia wants to get public support, they always go back to the Great War. You know, they call it the Great Patriotic War. They don't call it the Second World War. They don't call it the Eastern Front. It is the Great Patriotic War for Mother Russia. And that is what they're trying to cast this as. And to some degree, it's persuasive for some Russians. Um, but that is where they're leveraging this one small incident, this one tiny group of people within the Ukrainian force structure uh, that could be claimed, could be labeled as anti-Semite, neo-Nazis, and they're running with that as a piece of propaganda. And then you have individuals in the United States who are ill-informed, or at least they're reading our politics outward, and they're trying to, they may be not as comfortable with war. So you have the traditional pacifists here in America and who are like, you know, they're trying to look out from the mainstream. They get away from mainstream. What else is out there? How do I explain what's going on? And they're not comfortable with the far right wing networks. But then they begin to see these stories about neo-Nazis who are flying these weird flags. And what we're just seeing is that it the this minor, minor group of people have been amplified and used as a uh, this propaganda tool by various groups across the world. And, you know, for those of you who think like, oh, you know, maybe there are Nazis in Ukraine. Well, guess what? Uh, unfortunately, there are people who you could call Nazis in our military. Like every military in the world has people who are on the far left and who are on the far right. And if you just try and explode that outwards or just, you know, over label it as like this is all of that army, you know, then. This is well, that's a great point, because, uh, well, let's look at this. You know, I don't like those side by side things. Yeah, it's sure. like a weird subculture to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, man, I know some people that really like them. I like what you're saying. You know, you get people in all parts of the spectrum. But, like, so my my uh, sister-in-law and brother-in-law, they had one, and I went side-by-side -side riding mm -hmm. with them and my wife. Okay. First of all, I felt like I was at a neo-Confederate rally. Like, <laughs> never have I been at a place where there were so many confederate flags other than the peach festival mm. at the courthouse when i was growing up in clarksville <laughs> <laughs> but um you know so like national guard units for example mm. like how those work um you know you're gonna get like a bunch of people from the same town mm. join that unit they're all in together and maybe uh pretty extreme percentage of them uh, adhere to these sort of Jim Crow ideologies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that's a, that's maybe not unlike kind of what you're saying is going on over there. It's like you can't take that. You can't from that extrapolate mm -hmm. that, well, everybody in the military in the South that was in a Jim Crow state yeah. is racist. Right. You know, right. It, like that would be a stretch. Um, you know, it, it is a it is a weird social problem that exists for mm -hmm. sure. Like now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, oh, this would be a fascinating thing to really run with. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, because I mean, definitely. Um, the the thing to always remember when you study military history, you understand that the military that a society puts in the field reflects that society. Its divisions, mm -hmm. its politics, its social exactly. issues, and so that's what we're seeing in Ukraine. Um, but again, it's just this really weird thing now that you have people far right and far left agreeing that there are Nazis in Ukraine. It's like, where are we? <laughs> well, well, um, so like on the propaganda Nazi piece, like what about, uh, you know, like I hear a lot of stuff with um, Zelensky mm -hmm. from all over the mm -hmm. board, like from he's the greatest leader and the, the savior of Ukraine to... He, he's a United States installed puppet. Yeah. I mean, and you know, that's from like just different sources all over the mm -hmm. place. Yeah. Yeah. So the funny thing about that is, um, th what, one of the things we can take away from the Ukrainian war is that this is a masterclass in propaganda warfare, in psychological warfare, and the Ukrainians are exceedingly good at it. And maybe it helps that their leader was, you know, in television for a while and he knows how to do this. Maybe, we he learned some so things, Ronald Reagan, yeah. right? Yeah, right. So the great communicator. <laughs> Maybe they learned some things from us because you know we, the American military, completely mishandled our 
imaging of the invasion of Iraq and Afghan, uh, of Afghanistan. You know, um, we did not, even though in the United States we had this propaganda that we're fighting terror, you know, we weren't able to project that worldwide. And everyone was like, you guys are going in there for a while. Let's, let's be honest. So we weren't, we weren't masters of the narrative. The Ukrainians are mastering the narrative, and no one's believing the Russian side of it, and for various reasons, because you can't trust Putin as far as you can throw him. But that being said, you can't trust everything the, uh, the government puts out, the Ukrainian government. You can't believe everything that Zelensky says. And there are there is evidence that, you know, there's a good deal amount of money going to the uh, Ukraine that is not exactly earmarked for military spending. It has other functions. Part of that's state building. Part of that's the fact that they've lost their food supply. Part of the fact is that their infrastructure is crumbling. They've lost two major power plants and they just need your know, money to survive but also there's corruption in every single society and so it's it's legitimate to point that out yeah. but at the end of the day like as we saw you know you you got to make friends with people who aren't always like 100 percent perfect human beings and you got to sort of back you got to back people who could be morally ambiguous or not have pure hearts when you are dealing with the greatest single security challenge in american history in the last 40 years yeah, I mean, that's uh, kind of like uh, that iconic photo of uh, with Churchill, Stalin, and, uh, yes. yeah, you know, it's just like how, how he came together with that group for a minute. It's like, yeah. ooh. Yeah. yeah. You know, but... I mean, there's certainly, there, there's lots of criticism that could be leveled against the corruption that's been in Ukraine uh, in our part in fighting and promoting our own form of corruption because corruption is how we win, you know, in terms of influencing other governments, influencing other economies. Um, that being said, though, it's, you know, um, you got to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is, is that this is, if we allow this to continue, and I say we as the United States and sort of the Western democracies, if we allow Ukraine to fall, then there's no telling what will happen next. And one of the things that is ex exceptionally important is that the Chinese are watching this with a clock. And by the mm -hmm. Chinese, I mean the Chinese government. Obviously, this does not reflect on any Chinese person. We're talking about the government only. And the government's saying, how long will it take for Western democracies to get tired of this? When is too much money? When is too much time? When is too much sacrifice? And they're going to do that and say, that's the amount of time I have to take over Taiwan. And so that's the real, the real thing of us uh, right now is we have to prove that we are willing to sacrifice, deal with a little bit of pain in order to stop this challenge uh, to enter to peace in the hopes that it will dissuade future aggressors. Um, and you were talking earlier about, like, what will World War III look like? World War Three is going to be um, radically different than anyone thinks because our economy couldn't survive it. If we don't trade with China, we're talking it's over right then and there. The Chinese, uh, the <laughs> story, in 2007 during the Great Recession, the Russian government went up to the Chinese government and said, hey, you know what would be hilarious? Let's all dump American securities on the market at once and just watch their economy burn to the ground. And the Chinese said politely no because they understood it would also affect their economy. Mm -hmm. Since then, they've been doing nothing but building up their gold reserves and creating trade agreements that will allow them to sustain themselves over a prolonged war without full engagement with Western economies. And that is a thing that American policymakers need to be thinking about. Uh, how are we going to deal with an economic repercussion without even getting to the war itself? Because when China invades Taiwan, we stop trading with them, then we're in big trouble because our economy is entirely dependent on Chinese trade. And so unless we're building factories again and making our food supply uh, and our oil supply and just energy in general, doing everything more sustainable in the United States, we don't get to, you know, the great arsenal of democracy like we were in World War II, right? Because we are so reliant on people who do not have our best interests at heart. Yeah, no, that's uh, uh, yeah. So, well, and then like, so the propaganda piece, like, yeah. just wading through that, like, mm -hmm. that is going to be like, it's almost like you, when you were talking about, um, like Twitter during World War II, you know, it's it's almost like a, imagine, um, being like a normal American and like you're reading the papers, but then like you know, you're listening to the code channels. Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. in all in, in all the different languages like mm -hmm. his German coming over then like oh, oh, there's some some Native American dialects in here mm -hmm. like you know, you know just like all of the this the code channels like uh, that for for communication about things that like you would have no idea if you listen to it like that's kind of uh, wouldn't it have been hilarious to have like Twitter and all that during the Cuban Missile Crisis you would have had people saying you know what actually JFK put the missiles in Cuba himself if you think about it you know he's got ties to blah 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 like, I mean it would have been 
that is unimaginable. You know, it's so one of the benefits of mass communication is we're able to talk and be closer to one another and exchange information. And if that was a purely un, you know, a, a pure hearted educational thing, that would be awesome. But unfortunately, there are people who just like to watch the word world burn, who like to put out misinformation. And I, oh. I can just I, I, just the thought alone now that, you know, here's Kennedy backroom discussions you know with with russian ambassadors and he's he's doing his feelers with these agents in the field you know with K, uh, his cia talking with kgb and his brothers going out and then all that's like leaked on twitter or something like that you know and then it, 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 everything just like blows up in everyone's face so um american military thinkers are going to now increasingly have to grip with the idea of like how do we <laughs> engage in international conflicts and manage this flow of information because everyone with a phone can tell their own story now right yeah yeah, no, that's, um, well, interesting, too, like how much, th- like, the social media platforms have become, uh, have it, it, they're at the forefront of political debate, mm. right? Like, I mean, you know, CEOs are sitting before Congress yeah. uh, and also uh, being asked to do things by the FBI or not do things yeah. uh, in, our, in our different intelligence agencies. Um, you know... And this is something we won't know, you know, uh, it'd be something like looking back at Vietnam, I think, with this. But to what level do you think um, not just our our military in the form of advisors, but uh, our intelligence agencies, Mm. you know, CIA, NSA, are uh, involved in some way with what's going on uh, with Ukraine? Oh, I mean, one, uh, credit to where credit is due. 12 months ago, everyone said that U.S. intelligence agencies were just blowing smoke, that there would be no Russian invasion, that we were just stirring the pot. They were 100% right about it. And, and, and I mean, really, really accurate information about what Putin was planning, the timetables, mm-hmm. and it very close, like what they thought very closely was is what Putin did, right? So credit to where its credit's due. We successfully outed this ahead of time. No one, not even the Ukrainians, believed us. And then it happened. We were like, huh, right? Right. Uh-huh. That's yeah, like Rommel uh, with it, like the Normandy invasion, mm-hmm. like literally calls it. We're on the phone. He's like, uh, hey, uh, the invasion is here. He's like, no, it's not. Yeah. That's the fake invasion. Right. Yeah. The real invasion's coming up north. Yeah. You know, and it's like, okay. And then he has to eat a cyanide tab or something. I, I can't remember if he ate a tablet or uh, committed suicide. Like that, was the, that, that, was, that was after the, uh, the whole, uh, oh, God, what's that movie? The Valkyrie uh, assassination. Attempt. Yeah. He got, he got blamed for that. But yes, I mean, one, that's hilarious. Uh, two, um, dece- all war is deception. I mean, you, you always kind of calx what you're doing. And kind of nice segue, uh, Just to, I'll get to your previous question in a second, but I can't resist this urge. Um, the Ukrainians are showing us uh, a really good lesson in combined arms warfare and in deception. So I don't know if you know, any of your uh, followers have been watching this war closely, but there had been a, a buildup to a counteroffensive, and everyone was talking about it during the summer. Like, it's going to be in the south. It's going to be in the south. They're going to go after Crimea. They're going to take, you know, going to take it back from the Russians. They completely that led the Russians to move a huge amount of their forces to the south, and then they were able to punch through these areas that were lightly defended and pretty much negated six months of Russian gains because of deception and really, really sophisticated combined arms operations. So I just wanted to say that, how Mm -hmm. whole war is deception, right? Getting back to the intelligence thing, one of the purposes of education is one i i don't i don't show my political stripes to my students because oftentimes they can't tell what i am like left right up down center whatever um but what i do tell them is how it's important to know your rights so that you can see how your rights have been consistently violated for a very long time and specifically going back to what our intelligence agencies are doing in telecommunications companies everything single thing you say write do put out in the internet is on a government server somewhere, is on a uh, private server somewhere, and it will be leveraged against you in the future. And, I mean, the FBI has literal offices at AT AT&T and Sprint and and whatnot. I mean, this is all verifiable information. And it makes you sound kind of like a conspiracy theorist, right? Like, the government, you know, they they got feelers and warrantless wiretapping, but it's actually like, there are court cases on this. It's it's like, Mm -hmm. this is now the norm. Um, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but the Fourth Amendment, if you read it as an originalist judge, guess what? It doesn't say anything about warrantless wiretapping because they didn't have phones back then. It doesn't say anything about emails. Okay, it says you're securing your papers and your persons in your home. It doesn't say anything about your modern communications. So absolutely, that stuff is all being looked at by the government, looked at by private corporations. I don't know which one's the more dangerous at the moment, to be perfectly honest. But that's what we're seeing is that um, what I would, you know, 
to what level our intelligence agencies are dealing out with Ukraine. They are obviously training. They're obviously giving them intelligence. The Ukrainians would not be able to do half the stuff they're doing without us giving them information. The attack on the Muska, which was, uh, or the Muskova, the largest ship to be sunk since 1945, we did that. We helped them because we helped build the, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the missile that did that, and we gave them the intelligence where the ship was in real time. We are helping them plan their strikes all so our agencies are 100 percent there doing all this right but we can't talk about it loudly yeah. because if we do that's a justification that's a, for yeah. war well and that's, that's espionage too if you talk about you know you talk about it loudly and it's like that's what sucks about espionage and war is mm-hmm. that you have to set back also there's this cool stuff you're talking about this like okay team bad guy you know they they got one you know we got them but then there's like okay, we know you are about to get hit right here and yeah. you can't react because if you react, mm-hmm. they're going to know that, we, that, that we're we involved over here with this thing. Mm-hmm. You know, just like the interconnectedness of everything mm-hmm. that goes on, like things like Pearl Harbor and, and, and other events that you just have to sit on the intel. Yeah. As well, I personally am of the opinion that FDR did not really sit on anything. They thought the attack was coming in the Philippines. I don't think anyone realistically thought Pearl Harbor would get hit because it was uh, – it was an operation that Americans fundamentally did not think that uh, the Japanese were capable of, and we clearly got that uh, calculation wrong. But you are correct in absolutely pointing out that, I mean, uh, yeah, no, you're 100% accurate. Well, I mean, yeah, there's there's several, there, there's different examples. Like the Hitler example, it's just yeah. like with Intel, you know, like uh, the, we had had a whole operation across the, yeah. the pond right. that really had duped him. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, 100%. You know, and it's like... It, my friend Billy Reader, he's uh, always like, you know, working in communications, like mm. uh, tackling the what is true right. question. Yeah. Like, Ima- again, getting back to the previous point, imagine like the in- involvement in Afghanistan when we were supplying the Mujahideen. And, you know, now whenever we help the Ukrainians, it's out on Twitter, right? So imagine, you know, people on Twitter saying, you know, Reagan's giving all these missiles to the, to the Mujahideen in order to fight off the Soviets. It's like, you can't say that because they're going to get really mad and try and nuke us over it, even though they, they're obviously aware that we were doing it. And the, it's fascinating when you just sort of break this stuff down. Cause I mean, the, the high level examples and then like looking at the nuance of ways in which intelligence agencies, like for the, with the Afghanistan example, we did all these crazy things where we went and we bought Soviet supplies from the Israelis and we put it on Pakistani planes, or I think it was Saudi Arabian planes, to be flown to Pakistan, which were then hauled over the mountains to be given to the Mujahideen, right? So all of this was with plausible deniability, right? We're not even trying to do that right now. We're not even trying to pretend like we're not involved. And that has led a lot of people to be like, well, you know, maybe it's because of politics. We you know the Biden administration wants needs something to run on. Um, maybe that's part of it. Maybe it's just this is the new era and you keep, can't keep anything under taps because of interconnectedness. It's... All those are valid, I suppose. But it's certainly a new world that everyone is going to have to adjust to, and I cannot predict where it will go. I know. That's the end for it. That it but it is interesting to uh, to think about, mm-hmm. you know, to analyze. Uh, there's no, again, I just, like, look back at previous conflicts, like what you were bringing up at the beginning, and it doesn't matter if it's World War One, World War Two. Yeah. There's so many things, like, that you just can't predict mm-hmm. that that like that was that big of a domino like yeah. in, for not you know a different analogy there but um, like with you know uh, Franz Ferdinand mm-hmm. or whatever it's still like did anybody see that was going to be that big of an yeah. event that, right. that just like it, that was the lighting of the fuse yeah. um, so it's so funny you mention that because it's even harder to understand that when you then understand that there were there's a war in 1913 Right? There was a war in 1912. There was a war in 1911. There was a war in 1910. Why didn't those cause yeah. a massive First World War? And the answer is like, wow, there was just it was so much different nuances to those topics. Um, and so I have to explain those things to students. Is like, you know, it doesn't make sense in out of context. Context is key. And the more you know, the better off you are to understand those contexts and those nuances, so you make better informed decisions and you know, your opinions are more accurate than. Well, and yeah, some of those nuances are built around people that they were coming up with some of the political thought a hundred years before mm-hmm. or ninety nine years before, like at the fall of Napoleon, mm-hmm. and then again at like German unification. How, you know, there are kind of decisions being made 
and I think probably too in 1848. But the the decisions are being made to try and keep the map stable, keep Europe at peace, and you know, and then it's still, um, you know, when those people pass, like one of the the sort of points it's made is like, okay, well, who's going to uh, Bismarck's not here, so mm -hmm. who's going to take care of this now? Yeah, yeah, and teaching history accurately and getting those past conflicts understood helps you understand that sometimes the way that you learn things didn't actually go down the way they did. So like, have you ever heard of the Balkan inception scenario with the First World War? No, probably not. I don't know. So, what, what is it? So, so basically, the traditional way story is that, you know, France Ferdinand is shot, right? Then Germany gives a blank check. Austria-Hungary goes to attack Serbia. Everyone gets into war, right? The Balkan inception scenario was a was a policy made by the Russian and French governments in 1913 that said, hey, you know how there are all these wars in the Balkan Peninsula, and you know how Serbia's probably going to start one soon in the future, and you know how Austria-Hungary's got a pwn to pick with them? Wouldn't it be hilarious if we have a secret alliance that said that any time anything small happens in the Balkans, we mobilize, we being the Russians, mobilize our army immediately, because we know that the German military has a timetable mm -hmm. that says the second that I mobilize my army, the, um, the, the Russian army, they have to declare war on us and France in order to avoid a two-front conflict. In other words, they maneuvered Germany into a situation, and they knew that they would respond in a certain way, and they get, hoped that would happen so that they would appear to be the victims rather than the aggressors. So they made a perfect plan that forced the Germans to declare war because of a situation that they didn't cause that ended up in this huge conflagration. And it works because in 1919, Germany gets all the blame for it. Right? It worked perfectly. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Germany didn't have a role to play in this whole conflagration of the First World well, War. Well, they, they were paying all of the war guilt yes. uh, reparations. Yes. I mean, it, it, I can't remember how much it was. $32 like, billion. Oh, man. Like, yeah. it, and then it was just a big cycle of like, okay, well, we need you to pay that to them so they can pay us back. Tell us plan, yeah. You know, that would be great. Everybody needs paid by Germany. <laughs> like, I mean, so, yeah, but uh, the, the, I suppose what I was merely suggesting is just that once you understand, like, we take this event, right, and, and without context, and we're like, oh, man, it's simple. Germany is the bad guy, and everyone else is the good guy. But then it's like, man, kind of sucks that Germany was forced into the situation by two hostile countries. And when you understand that, then you can plan better for the future, right, and, mm -hmm. and try and uh, see that things are not cut and dry. Not everyone is clean and dandy. You know, there's uh, there's gray areas, especially in international relations and war. Some people still think that their parents had all the answers. If we're putting that on a on a scale. Well, I, I know my parents had all the right answers. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, like I, you know, I did like you. You did always know that one person that it's yeah. like, man, your parents are like the greatest parents ever. <laughs> like, and they, they turned out to be a great person. Um, but anyway. Yeah, so questioning authority. De omnibus debutatum. Doubt everything. It's a Latin phrase, right? And especially me or any professional, anyone, you need to go and do your own research. But that being said, you should trust professionals more than talking heads, you know, media personalities, politicians, and, you know, your Uncle Joe, who is a crackpot. <laughs> I that you'll like this one. Um, somewhat recently... It was like, this probably been a year ago, but it was like after things that I would say, you know, socially settled down a little bit. So, somebody had, um, his, it was actually my dad, but like made some comment about the Confederacy or mm -hmm. something. And then like, I just like avoid civil war debates with him. I mean, the, the place, it's not, it wasn't, they got, um, uh, what is it, uh, consolidated as a school like in the 80s or something, but now their mascot. Mm -hmm. is the rebels mm -hmm. the west side rebels <laughs> like literally like you like the mascot is a confederate soldier but anyway that's no, like I, my, my whole family's from that area but it's like oh yeah i thought about like you know breaking out the lecture notes which mm -hmm. are on the cloud on an app on my phone i could do that but just yeah. like i was like no nah, don't do it <clears throat> don't even talk about it um and and then i was like you ever read a book on the civil war yeah yeah have you have you read the documents? Have you read the secession conventions okay. of Georgia, of Texas, of Mississippi, where they literally say we're doing this yeah. to protect slavery, that we don't like, you know, abolitionists? Have they read 
uh, Jefferson Davis's message to the Confederate Congress, April 26, 1861. The cornerstone speech. Corners, yes, Alexander Stevens, exactly. The, the, I mean, the letters of the soldiers themselves. Yeah. We have. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that, that being said, that was the reason why the government seceded. I have to admit, private soldiers in certain states did want to fight Yankees. And there's a whole socialization process where they grow up where demonizing the other side, and they've been buying into conspiracy theories. You get on into the war a few years. I mean, so like what, what when I teach Civil War, I've been, I had the, the pleasure of teaching two section or two classes on the Civil War in uh, the last spring and fall at um, UARC. And my big t- selling point was how um, manipulative conspiracy theories are that northerners are believing in conspiracy theory of the slave power that's secretly going to destroy free labor mm-hmm. across the country yeah. and force slavery into the north. And they go and they look at things like uh, the Dred Scott decision, like, see. Now we can't even negotiate on slavery. This is proof of the slave power. And then you have on the other side, like the black Republican conspiracy. Oh my gosh, these abolitionists in the North secretly want to destroy slavery and force all of our daughters to marry black men, right? And they then look at things like what the abolitionist writings or they look at Harper's Ferry and they seem to get a confirmation. So an entire generation of people grew up with a generation of newspapers and politicians mm-hmm. feeding them conspiracy theories, making them more and more radical until they destroyed themselves. And I personally think that may be a lesson for today. Yeah. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And, you know, people think, some, some people think you're crazy for, like, wanting to look back. Civil War's over. It's been over for this long. And it's like, yeah. hey, don't even get me started on Reconstruction. That's, a, like, that's where I'll go with, the, like, you know, because it. it exactly. It, and, I, man, when you start moving forward yeah. socially, politically uh and you look at things and you go to civil rights it's like i think we talked about this before like when both of us when we teach us too we start with reconstruction even though it's 1877 we are like you can't understand the 20th and 21st century unless you understand the fight over the 13th 14th and 15th amendment yeah yeah no um i I was somewhat recently going through my us2 notes because i had uh dr moses now retired but um like the whole section is race and power mm-hmm. uh, and it's 65 to uh oh man and then it like it immediately segues over into cowboy culture <laughs> i'm just like what a dramatic change <laughs> like i'm like like just I just oh man like 13 pages like really good reconstruction notes mm-hmm. and it's like cowboy culture Hey, hey, hey. Well, it was it was a, it was a needed relief. I'm uh, not... Yeah, absolutely. And I love westerns, even though they're horribly inaccurate. <laughs> I love them. I'm sorry. What did you think? This is not really. I guess so. You could say. Um, you know, I um, I like Django, but what did you think of the Hateful Eight? Did you see that? Hateful Eight. Yes, hey, Tarantino. I Tarantino. Yeah, yeah. It was all right. Um, I mean, Tarantino is a. He's got his own craft, and I there. I like some of his movies. You know, um, the, the, the classics, obviously, but. Um, some of his other stuff, a little bit, a little bit out there. That being said, um, I did enjoy it. Uh, I like the Magnificent Seven, the new version, a little mm-hmm. bit more. I thought they did a really good job with that. Um, and uh, there was a Hostile. Did you see that with uh, Christian Bale? I have not. I've not seen that, but it's about the Comanches, right? It's so it's about. Uh, if I remember correctly. It's uh, these natives who want to get back to their home turf, but they have to be escorted by a guy yeah. who hates them. And then it's like a story of his progression to finally where he understands that, like, okay, these are not terrible people. I was reading, I, I want to say I was thinking about watching on streaming the other day. Yeah. But, like, yeah, Christian Bale, like, he's got to, like, take this, mm-hmm. like, a chief or something, yeah. like, across, like, several miles. Right. And, but, yeah, that's, uh, you know, there's not enough good Westerns anymore. Yeah, I mean, and so to segue that, did you get to see the the prequel to the Yellowstone? It was eighteen eighty three. The Tim it? McGraw. Yeah, yeah, yeah did you watch yeah, it? What do you think it. of it? I, I liked it. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I like that franchise, mm-hmm. and you know, it's it's like with Breaking Bad. I really like how um, they made all the spinoffs. You know, there's a movie, and then there's the prequel show yeah. that ties in. Yeah, um, and. It's just interesting, you know. We hadn't really seen stuff like that, um, and you know, I, I'd be interested to see. Like, I had uh, high hopes for like Westworld, but mm-hmm. it wasn't. 
I haven't seen that. Insane. It's weird. So we, my wife and I did watch uh, 1883, and there were p- moments where I was almost brought to tears because it was so beautiful. When that girl in her, you know, that, that, that wispy voice was saying some of the poetic lines, I'm like, oh, yes, this is beautiful. Also, it's just, you know, they're just really trying to, like, you know, heap love on Texas. She's like, this is heaven on earth. Like, okay, thank you very much, Texas, right? But there were other points where I'm like, they're making fun of, like, the immigrants for not knowing anything. Like, oh, these Europeans, they're just taxed, and they're so dumb, and they don't know anything. Like, these are peasants from Europe they, they've lived like they've gone through worse than, like trust me like they may not know how to make it across the prairie, prairie but they, they know something they're not that dumb yeah. and just this whole like you, you don't you don't have guns or, you know some of, like, again uh, you know pro Sam second Elliot, amendment you know, pro, right pro second amendment but at the same time they took it a little too far it's like if you don't have guns you're just gonna die out in the west and it's like yes and no I saw a guy at Walmart earlier right after I texted you it was yeah. like it's one o'clock um, and he was like open carry. Mm-hmm. I was walking in Walmart mm-hmm. and he was walking out and I was just like, mm-hmm. but that's kind of normal. Yeah. Like I see that all right the time here. around here. Around here. Yeah. And again, so like, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily care about what your, what anyone's opinions of it. I honestly think people should be a little bit more well-trained if they're going to handle firearms. That's just me. Yeah. Uh, Cause I went through a lot of training in Florida just because I wanted to, I wanted to be safe. But, you know, my whole point was just that that show is really emblematic of like this narrative of the West. We have rugged individualism, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, gun culture, all that sort of stuff. And while it had very poetic moments, it was not entirely accurate. And I would have liked to seen something maybe a little bit more. Uh, more nuanced, a little bit, but you know, it is what it is. You know, it's, it was a decent one. Apparently, watch. they're doing another, um, like, like 1923 or something like that. Like, they're they're just supposed to be doing like mm-hmm. little spin offs all the way up to like the present. This is, it's Hollywood for you, right? Like, yeah. we, we, we got we cowboys are in right now. They have we haven't done they hadn't seen it this way yeah, before. Yeah, we got to go do the 1920s uh, so we can add in different guns and different suits, but it's the same concept if you think about it, right? Dude, I, like, so original. yeah, um. Well, and like in the streaming era mm. and everything, yeah. it's just like it's honestly like we're getting, we're getting duped because it's like we can binge things. Yeah. Uh, it is you know the way they are formatting things where it's like you get a series, then you get a movie, then another series. It, you know we hadn't seen that sort of stuff before culturally. Yeah, and you know I fall into this because I'm watching the Andor series right now. I don't know if you like Star Wars, but I love. I it. like Star Wars a lot. Um, I have uh, all of the powers of the uh, power of the Force action figures, nice. but. Um, nice. 95 through 2000. Mm. <laughs> but I'm going to display them over there where those skateboards are. Um, but I have not got into Andor. I, I really enjoyed Mandalorian. Mm, uh, Book of Boba Fett. Mm, yeah, exactly. They made them too soft. They made them too soft. Yeah. I, have, I know. That's not my Boba Fett. Yeah. No. no. He doesn't um, speak. He shoots people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I I started Andor, but like I had like uh, we had some friends over mm-hmm. and like we just, after dinner and mm-hmm. like uh, I need to go back. Um, you really do. It's a slow burn, and this this is what I've been personally waiting for, like a mature take on the universe. And it, I am I'm all in on it. I really enjoy it so far. It's slow in places, but I I like Rogue One job. a lot. Yeah. That being said. Disney is just spamming everything, you know. That yeah, that's probably what got us here. They really are. Like, uh, well, and then another thing, I I kind of I said this like right early on at the beginning of the pandemic, man. I do not think we're gonna have like the traditional in a traditional sense, especially like towns like Russellville mm-hmm. movie theaters. Mm-hmm. I don't even think that's like for whatever reason. Like, I, I mean, I never go to the movies, but it's like now, like I can just watch it on HBO Max, yeah. like at my house. Yeah. I uh so I love movie theater. I love. Movie, I do too. You know? I, I I do. I but, also hate getting leaving the helm. <laughs> yeah, well, and, well, since the pandemic, it's yeah. like, you know, really, I liked it. I went to the movies a lot in the pandemic because mm-hmm. they were like, we're showing Jaws. I'm like, yes. Yeah, it. <laughs> it, 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 like whatever it was. <laughs> I mean, filmmaking that's best. Yeah, yeah like I want to go see like really like retro throwback movies. Yeah. I really. Yeah, like, I'll watch the new stuff at home, but can we watch, like, cinematic history on the big screen? Right. And I I wonder if that's not going to be, like, you know, the movies, theaters that make it, Mm -hmm. what it's going to be like for them. You know, uh, it's so funny that you mentioned that. I was just reading, I can't remember who it was by, but it it, basically it's a critique that men like Steven Spielberg and, and George Lucas are saying that what we're seeing with these big studios is they are just putting out tons of like ip right it's just all marvel massive universe and we're losing like the sundance movies we're losing like a guy with a little camera kevin smith 
who can go and shoot a black and white movie in front of a, a, a gas station or a, a convenience store and turn it into a giant franchise that, you know, that now, that in, what an entire generation fell in love with. And for those of you who don't know, Kevin Smith is creative with Clerks and Mallrats and Dogma. Huge and, Star Wars fan. Yeah, yeah. Huge Star yes, Wars. Yes. I, I, I just love listening to that dude talk about Star Wars. He, he, he has these entire, uh, uh, these series of talks that he's made documentaries out of where he just gets up and tells stories. And he's just a ma- he's a master crafter of, of storytelling. But my whole sort of spiel with that was merely just to say, it must be hard for someone you know like you at your level. You are building this business, you're building this brand and everything, and you have to compete with people who are just spamming the heck out of. I thought about this today, dude. That's yeah. kind of why it's come up a couple of times yeah. on the podcast because it is like people are spamming. Like anybody can do this. Yeah. But like I'm trying also to do something different like I, I and i know i'm capable of that but like the the f- bottleneck is the stuff that you were talking to me about before we started podcasting mm-hmm. like i had to learn all this stuff you mm-hmm. know and it's like oh, i want to do this but mm-hmm. you don't know how to do that yeah and then so so like you're trying to build this podcast and you're putting it out relatively independently but if you want more traction then you have to belong to this this podcast company right that's going to boost you more and it's going to put you, you know, on spotify and all these other places and okay you could be a small documentary maker but you need to be bigger so you can get on like lumens or whatever they call it nowadays right so that you can boost that that message or boost that yeah. audience reach uh which you know is legitimate right that's just the way business is but it stifles creativity in a way, and it creates it, does, it, it creates monopolies. And I think you know, this is a free market economy, and you know, monopolies stifle competition. Yeah. Well, and then another thing too, like uh, one of the reasons, like I've been curating all my episodes, descriptions, thumbnails, edit mm-hmm. editing the audio, MP3, and then video, getting everything on this uh, terabyte, uh, massive seven terabyte drive I've got right up under here, and then mm-hmm. also um, out on the cloud. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I never, like with YouTube, mm-hmm. I'm not saying like I don't put out anything like controversial that I'm worried about mm-hmm. like getting censor- censored mm-hmm. for. But, um, you know, with like the big, deb- there's a, a big debate about free speech extending into the World Wide Web mm-hmm. and it, for applying for the th- with con- content creators. And yeah. I think that's another thing that we're behind on as well. Mm-hmm. Um but I, I definitely want to have all that stuff uh, just kind of like, okay, this is here. I've got it backed up because if whatever platform crashes or, you know, goes one direction or another or isn't a thing in 10 years, I've still got my whole database. Yeah, right. Uh, it, it would be terrible if you had all of your pictures on MySpace and like, MySpace isn't around anymore, right? So like, yeah. uh, one day Facebook won't be around. So people, get your pictures off Facebook while you can before it all crashes. <laughs> yeah, like... Or, like Oh, you got your stuff on a seven terabyte drive. You haven't upgraded to Neuralink, like that. that <laughs> like you, that isn't in your brain now. All right, yeah. Oh so, man. I mean, will Dropbox be around forever? Will the cloud be around? And well, exactly. Like, what's after the cloud? Like some sort of Neuralink type interface where, like, we don't speak to each other. We're just like, oh, but bro, you plug your Neuralink in. Yeah, no, I'm trying no, to talk no. to you right now. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope I am well past at that point. You know, I'm sure it'll be great for our future generations, but no, thank you. <laughs> you did, well, you know what's funny is like, imagine like no one would want to be the early adapter. Yeah. Like, I mean, like who's gonna who's gonna be like I'm gonna stand in line to yeah. test this out spontaneously, kind of bust in the process, <sighs> like like they, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. Well, man, so. Uh, like last uh you know um thing on this ukraine thing mm. I mean, we can we can wrap it up here uh it's been an awesome yeah awesome conversation appreciate and, it um enjoy myself yeah well and I, I was wanting to have you back on like i know we talked on the phone it's been a few months back but um it just like man i just had to get like it once i got out of the college i was back here mm. and it's like perpetually getting caught up we've added this parking and all oh, this man. other stuff and the gym is busy no, I, I can tell. I mean, and uh, so, 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 if listeners out there, you're going to miss this whole thing that we're going to do after this where he's going to tell me the secrets of Russellville politics and building and everything. And it's gonna, we're going to... One of the candidates for mayor was in this room at 6 a.m. the other day. Oh, really? Yeah. I, and we could talk about that uh, off air. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I'm very interested in also. It's yeah, small town uh, politics. Oh, it's, I, yeah. See, I, 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 I lamented to you about that um, a couple of times, yeah, I think. Yeah. It's going on again, of course. like over here, and then like the the church is doing all the stuff next door to us too. Yeah. 
But we, we can't say that out loud, otherwise yeah. we're gonna we're gonna be attacked. Yeah, because you could get taken off YouTube or something. Um, right. Anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, militarily speaking, uh, with this Ukraine thing, yeah. like what's um, what are some new things that we're seeing? So uh, other than intel and like okay. a, the intelligence agencies and cyber uh, side of things. So one of the things I've been fascinated with is um, one just the roles that new technologies are playing um there was there's something on twitter i know twitter is not something to be trusted but it's so funny because it's this russian expert going on a russian tv show and he says hey don't ask me any questions about these iranian drones because we all know they're from iran but we can't admit that and so right there we've already found out wow iran is supplying a lot of drones well what does that mean well for those of you who don't remember the american government several years ago lost a drone over iran it crashed and was completely intact and they dismantled it reconstructed it and boom they've created their own fleet now and guess who they sold that to i mean they sold it to everyone who wanted it right across the globe right uh unfortunately americans leave behind or we make mistakes sometimes we leave behind equipment which is then deconstructed and the enemy tries to pick up our ideas they can't always reconstruct what we do though and i think this war is a perfect example that the russians and actually the entire world thought they were capable of things that we do and all my students are saying, you know, there was that giant tank column outside of Kiev at the beginning of the war. Why didn't they just blow it out of the, just blow it off, you know, boom. I'm like, well, we're the only ones capable of launching drone strikes to it or coordinating air campaigns at a level that you can have a highway of death situation like we did with uh, the Iraq war, Desert mm -hmm. Storm 91, where we just laid out the entire Republican Guard in a, in a massive column of fire, right? We are the only ones who can do that. And we know this because when the Europeans tried to topple Gaddafi himself uh, in the Libyan intervention, they had to come to us for all their intelligence packaging, to put together their strike uh, options, to refuel their airplanes. Like, even Europe can't do this stuff on their own. Yeah. So, like, what we're seeing is when we train people and give them the technology and hold their hand, they're able to do stuff. But otherwise, they're not able to perform at the level we do. And that being said, even when we perform at that level, that doesn't mean that we win because we can win in Afghanistan or Iraq. All yeah, we did was point. all we did. And this is one of the things that intelligence analysts are saying right now is don't get too gleeful about what's, what we're watching and saying like, yay, the Russians are terrible. Because guess what? We failed going against less. And what will that mean in the future when we go up against someone with what we call near parity? Because China is near parity with us. They, they can't do everything we can do, but they can do a lot. What will it mean? And that's going to be a really interesting thing to watch. Yeah. Um, but certainly, war as we know it is changing. I'm not going to go as far as saying the tank is obsolete. You're going to see that all the time in CNN and Fox News. The tank is obsolete. Tank warfare is obsolete. They're, they just get blown up by anti-personnel or anti-tank mines or these rockets or drones or whatever. Well, guess what? The Ukrainians pulled off a massive counteroffensive with tanks, and the Russians couldn't stop them, even with lots of equipment like the Ukrainians had. So maybe the age of the tank isn't done. Well, people say the age of the fighter aircraft is done. Look, use a couple of guys with these Stinger missiles or the new versions of these MPADs. They can just shoot anything out of the sky. Well, not exactly, because you know, there still are, are your operations occurring over Ukraine. So you want to gain insight, but you don't want to go too far. And right now, there are people just making bukus of money, just studying this and studying this. And the military is um, going to have to adjust. And one of the hardest things for militaries to do is adjust. Because think about it, you need big factories to build complex things, right? Mm -hmm. And that requires training, that requires logistics, that requires all these different sort of interconnected pieces. But what we need to see, and there was actually a really great podcast about this called War on the Rocks. Uh, it's where a bunch of intelligence analysts sit down, they're saying, you know, startups in uh, um, uh, technology in terms of just, you know, private civilian use, they're able to do things that big companies can't because they don't have the overhead, they don't have the pensions, they, they're able to move quickly, they're able to adapt, they can, they can put forward these small ideas and, and innovate quicker. And it's hard for them to break into the defense industry because the, to, to, to do anything with the defense industry, you need to spend millions of dollars up front perfecting this item and then trying to market it to people who are honestly being paid by other defense companies you know, to make sure they keep buying their pet projects. So mm -hmm. the American military is going to need to rapidly adapt and um, innovate for future conflicts. Um, and Ukraine is showing us this, and that is why everyone who is very intensely watching it. But also, you can't get ahead of yourself. You can't overemphasize. you got to sort of reevaluate consistently 
and um, not sort of get on the bandwagon where it's like, you know, three months ago, everyone's like, Ukraine's going to win, Ukraine's going to win. Now it's like, well, this is going to take a little bit longer. It's going to be more complicated than we thought. Yeah. And it's going to be a showdown of wills. Yeah. Isn't it funny? It's always the war is going to be over by Christmas sort of thing. Civil war, right? Like yeah. One battle. Yeah. And then we're going to get out. We, we, uh, the Nazis thought that they would take out the Soviet Union, just kick in the door. The whole thing would fall down is what Hitler said. Uh, bring a picnic. We'll watch from the hill. Right. Yeah. Right until the Union Army starts retreating. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank, thank you uh, very much, uh, Irving McDowell. <laughs> uh, uh, bad plan, but green troops. So, yeah, another thing, make sure your people are, are trained, which the, the Russian army is not. But, I mean, this this war, you could uh, we could spend an entire series of just, like, talking about each phase of the war, which there are, like, five phases at this point, right? The first phase, where it's, like, this bullets on the capital, where they're trying to do all these crazy little things that um, made sense at the time. They're like, okay, well, the, the, the paratroopers need their role, so they're going to go take the airport because they, they do that all the time. They did that in Kosovo. They did that in Afghanistan. It's their go-to move, right? You take the airport, then you bring in heavy equipment. Well, then if they do that, then the Navy has to have their amphibious operation. Well, if they do that, then, then this unit needs to do that. And it's not just a Russian problem because we fell into the same trap in Grenada. It's like, okay, well, the SEALs have to do this, and the Rangers have to do that, and the Marines have to do that, and it led to a bunch of SEALs getting themselves killed. Mm -hmm. And it's a, I don't, did you ever remember the movie... Um, Sean claude no, no, it's uh, Steven Seagal on Missouri. It's under siege. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, Tell yeah. I haven't general. seen that in over ten years. Right. So there's a there's a line in that movie where they talk about the SEAL officer punching out his CEO because he got his guys killed. They're referencing Grenada, right? Mm -hmm. Where we were so obsessed with getting everyone to do a little piece that we weren't thinking about streamlined military operations, and it got people killed. Okay. Uh, have you ever? I know you probably know who Jocko Wilnick is, but um, he has a, a book called Extreme Ownership. Yeah. And he kind of talks about that, like uh, in um, this is Ramadi Iraq that he is talking about in mm. this book a lot. Yeah. Um, but basically, how like there are all of these little like, hey, uh, would you go ahead and check with that guy again just to be sure before we go ahead and blow up that neighborhood real quick, just mm -hmm. just one more time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, and and it's you know, but he's talking about like the hard lessons learned by mm -hmm. not like calling and checking literally twice with everyone on mm -hmm. everything because it means people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he's a jujitsu black belt too. Um, former seal. Yeah. Real I've, interesting guy. I've seen some of his stuff. Yeah. Some yeah. of it I like. So it's a little out there, but that's everyone. Yeah, I know. Like the the one the big iconic video every meathead's into is he'd be like, "Oh yeah, the worst day of your life, good." <laughs> and, and it's like, "Oh, your whole family died in a plane crash, <laughs> good." This is so intense, dude. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. Whoa. I I heard his his breakdown of the Evaldi thing, and I was like, okay, there's some there's some good analysis there, but I think. Um, Law enforcement training. He's got some great commentary on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Training. Uh, you are an expert on training. Training is key for every, training for academia, training mm -hmm. for business, training for military, training as a as a influencer, as a content creator. I hate those words. Um, it's it's a thing. It's a thing, and you need it. You can't. Uh, this is important too, because I tell my sons this all the time. You know, my my youngest stepson, he his older brother plays basketball. He hates that he keeps beating him. I'm like, well, you don't go out and train. You don't go out and put in the effort. You're gonna lose. That's really one. You're younger, and two, you don't train. You want to get better, you train. That's that's life, okay? You sit around doing nothing, then it just all goes away. And so you got to constantly push yourself to the next level, whether that's reading a book a day, whether that's you know putting time to work out, work on your jujitsu, whatever it is. Well, and what's what sucks is even on that model, depending on who you are and when you develop and how how aware you are of how you learn or get better at things, you may suck for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. It like, and I just never knew that when I was a kid. I wish I had like somebody being like, you know, you might not be good at it for years. Yeah. And, and like, really, I tell my jujitsu students this all the time. I'm like, all the cool stuff I do in life, I sucked at for a long time. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I still think I suck at it, really. You know, I was a terrible high school student. I was awful. I, I you know, like, I, I got out of there maybe with a 2.9 or something. I had a 2.9. Yeah, you know, just barely able to get into college. Then I got, you know, my BA was, my first half of it was math. Then I got into history class. Oh, got better. My MA, okay, a little bit better. Then my PhD, 4 0, right? So I tell my students this I was a terrible student. I had, I had lots of trouble. I had, I had depression. I had, you know, I had just good issues with other coursework. But you keep at it, things get better. 
as long as you stick with it, as long as you keep, you push yourself, you push yourself to the next level. Well, and I mean, I think too, a big part of it is like, as you become an adult, you do become aware. I mean, for some people, mm. that maybe college is to that, for that, how you learn. Mm. I had to learn how to learn. I did not acquire that skill in high school. Right. Um, and I was into college, yeah. uh, and arguably like really like all of the, fru- all of the great, um, things that have come to fruition for me have mm-hmm. been at, on the other side of college. Right. So. Right. I mean, so, and then, so we're going to go full circle now back to the original topic. It, it seems like there is ways that we could change education so that we teach people how to learn rather than just basic subject material and, and stop the politicization of the, of the, of the lesson plans. Let's just build young people to make you know a better future you know let's invest in them and let's be open to changes but also understand that like not everyone is the same and everyone needs different help and different levels and uh you just have to be uh, you have to adapt and you have to you have to foster that one that love of learning and to teach them how to do it and then keep up with it you know you, you just uh, okay you're out of fourth grade now bye like no follow up continue to be a presence in their life well, and then too, like the concept of lifelong learning, mm-hmm. like every semester that I was teaching, I was learning, not only learning new stuff right. about Egypt, mm-hmm. was like revising things, like I was going through it with them right. every time. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, and that's uh, something too, it's just like uh, just continuing to learn, continuing mm-hmm. to learn new things about things you like, I mean, it, particularly like this a martial arts lesson, but it's like. A lot of people will quit after earning a black belt, and it's just like, okay, you 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 meet you met the goal, like this is it. It's the uh, it's the, you got the hundred percent in the game, you stop playing, right? So, you, yeah, which you know, this is something that the sons do, but I mean, that's that's a perfect analogy, really, as to to encapsulate that point. And just like you, like I am an expert in civil war, right? I I probably fought, forgot more about the civil war than most people know. That being said, when I was teaching these classes in the fall of I guess this was twenty twenty one, the spring of twenty twenty two. I was learning so much more than I ever knew. And I was like, oh my God, I knew nothing about the Civil War. Like, I was trash. And so I'm going to teach this course in the spring. Please take it. Early, uh, the um, early Republic to Antebellum America. So that's Ooh. 1787, the Constitutional Convention, to 1848, the end of the Mexican American War. And it's a, such a brilliant period because you go from a collection of colonies that are not even really sure that they want to be a combined country they're not really sure if this whole thing called the united states of america is going to actually work to then 1830 it's like yes this is a country man we're going through all these changes they're really scary the economy is 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 is, is radically altering upending some lives making some richer making some poorer then at the same time you have this rebirth of religion and it's infusing the country with some really great ideas other a little bit crazier than others that lead to some people making very poor life decisions and then finally you get to 1848 where it's like the road to disunion the fight over the expansion of slavery and the coming civil war the impending crisis uh, david potter thank you very much <laughs> so yes yes um anyway i can i'm gonna learn so much even though i've taken classes on this i have tons of notes on it i have I mean, wall to wall and books on this it is going to be a hardcore every single day readathon study, write, research, and then try to impart this in a way that makes sense to the students, right? Well, and man, that's the true value though. Is like, no one is making you do that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. who is who is over there over your shoulder being like, you better learn more about the Civil yeah. War this time before you teach. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, right. you could just you. Yes. You, but but that's passion. Yes. And. Yes. That's what we do. We're not cookie cutters. We want to do this, and we're good at what we do, and we keep we keep trying to be better, right? And so that's, I mean, that's the... Yeah. You can't, you know, can't issue a bunch of student loans on that on that idea because not everybody will be that. That's true. And, you know, there's that's a whole other set of topics because there are times where, I mean, obviously that investment in you paid dividends, It right? did. It right? did. You know what it I... paid dividends for Marie, right? It did, for, for sure. You know what I think is, though, like um, the biggest disconnect is people like, you know what I used to want to be? A radiology technician. (laughs) Why? Because they made $36,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And when I was like 17 years old, that sounded great. I was like, yeah, like 36,000 divided by 12. Like, Mm -hmm. wow. Like, it's like no one's telling me about, um, you know, taxes. But 
again, another thing that we should be teaching better. Like, I wish someone had taught me how to balance a checkbook. Back, back when you had to, by the way. This isn't a thing anymore. I wish people had told us about, like, home buying. Oh, my God. You know, we bought a home recently. The amount of things that you have to learn to do oh, that. Oh, I know, and then dude. Just I know. You got it. You got it. Uh, the whole deal's been done, though? Yeah, that was that was last August. And, I mean, it was. It, it's been great. Uh, we love it. But, I mean... Talk about just everything going wrong in the first year. Have a year. water leak yet? Um, actually, I'm, that's why I keep looking down at my phone. Oh, is everything not, okay? So, like, okay. Um, <laughs> black plastic apparently is a thing here in, in the region uh, where it's just very cheap uh, piping that is, is breaking all over the place. Oh. Like, I talked to this water company guy today. He's like, yeah, in Russellville, it just, like, stuff just pops off everywhere. And there's water leaking everywhere. So I got water leaking in my street right now. I've already had two different plumbers coming. A guy's supposed to come today at some point. And, you know, he's on the You guys other, still live out in Dover? No, no, no. We're we're here. In, I'm off uh, Ridgewood, so it's like right next to the West Main Gallery and whatnot. Okay. You know what that is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I used to live over in uh, the Shadow Lake Apartments over yeah. there. So anyway, we uh, we live in that area, and we got this. Uh, house issues are a thing no one trains you on that no one teaches you like know, hey guess man. what don't trust a uh don't, don't trust every inspector you talk to because they will miss stuff like don't necessarily trust a real estate agent because they will miss stuff go go look this up this is the, the you will find tons of articles mm -hmm. my my cousin is studying to become an appraiser and it's actually this long years long yeah. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. like in it I'm just kind of like dude this better pay off in the end for you because mm -hmm. man like you're not even close <laughs> you've been doing it for years but um, there are studies out there like um, like they set these people up, like go in this house, how mm. much is this house worth? Mm. You know, nice white family lives here, nice white neighborhood. Yeah. And then um, same house, they swap it out for yeah. Yeah. people of color, right. uh, yeah. you know, different ethnicities, mm -hmm. but, but mainly black people. Right. And the appraisal values come back like sometimes like, I mean, I'm like hearing about this, and I'm like, oh, sixty thousand or something. Like he, he told me about this. He this training he did, yeah. and um, I, like I'm talking like a hundred thousand. Yeah. Like you know, like yeah. like atrocious numbers yeah. Yeah. on uh, these uh, different uh, you know minorities. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, man, oh, that is so disheartening. <laughs> like I was with my buddy Thurman. I was like texting him. I'm like, look at these links. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! Mm -hmm. Like, can you believe this is going on? It's it's unfortunate. It's a thing, uh, but I mean, so the point I suppose we were both talking about. Is they don't teach you any of this, right? Yeah. They don't teach you any, and and I mean, there's already so much to teach them, right? Yeah, the 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 three what, what was it? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yeah. <laughs> three R's. <laughs> no, yeah, Miss Nellie. Um, and yet, and now there's so much more now to teach. Um, how do you teach all of it? When I asked well, you how many like, students you deal with, which I was like, I had 32 per yeah. class. Um, but man, just like dealing with hundreds of students, mm -hmm. uh, and like, that's what I see going on at like the, like the elementary teachers mm -hmm. and stuff. I'm like, how are you teaching this for your kids? I'm, uh, my children are thankful to be in the Dover school district and it's, it's great for them. Uh, they have really great teachers there. Um, but not everyone's like that. You know, I, I, I'm a big advocate of public school because I, I went to public school, you know, and I loved it. And I know a bunch of friends who went to private schools and it did not do them any favors whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I, I Small classes are clearly better because you have are more closer with the students. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of education in general is about money and budgets. In terms of higher education, it's about making as much money as possible. And in you know, local education, it's about the city's only going to give you a little bit of this, and you're going to have to make it work, and then you're going to have to pay out of your own pocket to make things work. Because mm -hmm. every teacher spends their own money, works more than one job in order to do this, and yet we treat them so terribly. If I hear one more parent say you work for me i don't work you know i'm gonna f just flip out like yeah okay dude yes you're a voter yes they are public employees <coughs> treat them with a little bit of respect yeah that is i mean teaching it's a selfless <laughs> underappreciated thing i mean it's uh you you don't like i i just like when i was getting out i was like it was to the point it's like i i haven't been do doing this for the money the whole time mm -hmm. and it's just like a good time to <laughs> cut ties so um but i really enjoyed it yeah oh yeah it, it's fulfilling it's life-changing it i mean i'm happiest when i'm teaching well i i me too but i will also say like i like teaching i can do that here <laughs> um but i also like this exchange here oh, yeah. you know one thing when i was teaching like i didn't you know get to go like watch McCool's class or like you know like hang up in the podcast but um like just get to hang out with other intellectuals other historians you know it's like that's a, a way i interface too that um i mean i just really enjoy 
um, getting to hear from people that may know more than me and it's inspiring to me and conversation too and I learn things and it's great you know if you are in a good department or a group around a good group of people a good school district whatever you want to call it and you are able to have that exchange that is awesome mm -hmm. but you know schools universities are just like businesses as well you know sometimes you got that person in the office you don't like that you can't talk to that's always going to be a problem that's just life it's not just a school problem. I had, I, like yeah that. i mean i had that same parent you're talking about the other day and like they were like like lamp like come in the door yelling at me and i was like Who, who's your kid because <laughs> like I, I i teach the older kids and the higher ranked kids mm -hmm. teens and her but this lady like uh what had happened is her her kid had um well, I just better yeah, 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 we'll yeah, say yeah, it's yeah, off yeah, the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it was a big misunderstanding and then uh but come to find out it kinda wasn't and she but she was very mean to us and I was scared of her. That's unfortunate. <laughs> and again, you know, maybe one of the things I would like to see is, you know, teachers have their role, but parents are also part of this process, not just not just in terms of, you know, raising their children, which is an extremely important thing, very rewarding, but um helping foster that lifelong learning talking at the dinner table engaging with them don't just mm -hmm. be on the screen it's the biggest battle that we have going on right now and i you know i'm guilty of it. i let my kids probably watch too much screens then you know i I'm, i probably watched too much screens when i was younger but uh, you do what you can and i think sometimes parents think that you know schooling is just during the day and then you come home and you do other things it's like no it's you, you're part of this process as well and your kids conduct in public reflects you you know and hopefully you are uh, not all not every parent is perfect not every child exactly follows what their kids say but um you know it, they learn from what they see and i you hopefully you model those the behavior you want them to show in yeah in society no i mean that's that's it you know it's um the, the it takes a village type of a thing you know yeah. uh it, and it definitely does it's a collaborative effort between you know, I think um, teachers, parents, administrators, uh, and then just like the culture, mm -hmm. like having a culture where you live and then inside of the, the, the school, the business, um, because that's one thing that like why we're successful. It's like a cultural thing right here at the right. gym. Like it is very much a cultural thing mm -hmm. uh, and very much a not trying to be passive aggressive micromanagers mm -hmm. of the students or the people that work here connecting with the businesses connecting with your fellow you know people communities you know helping you know outreach all that sort of stuff i'm yeah. sure you do engage a lot of we have done uh, yeah all, and it's just ever growing crazy well that's good i'm about that's to good. put up a side obscuring fence though that's gonna that's gonna be uh but it's like the the fine print it's like you got to do all this stuff or you could just put up a fence. I'm like, I'll take the fence. Regulations are sometimes good, and sometimes they're overburdensome. But at the end of the day, it's, you, you got to do what you got to do, right? Yeah, that is true. That is true. Well, man, um, it's been awesome. We've been going almost two hours. Oh, so uh, uh, I let you flies. go. It, it really does. A it, 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 great conversation. I really appreciate you coming out. And um, hopefully this water situation is... Uh, if that if that's over by Vancouver, you know I have a friend that lives over there, and he said his water bill's been like a hundred and thirty bucks, and he lives like like it's like him and like a couple other people like. Well, we'll 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 talk more after yeah, this, but but yeah. um again, yeah, you know, very different than from when I was living in Florida, right? Yeah. And you, you learn that like you're just gonna have to talk to the the, the local dude who who knows what's up, and you know um just try and figure out how, what works. Um, yeah. Yeah, way different, yeah. but anyway. Thank you very much for bringing me on. Been a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll have to collaborate in the future, man. Definitely. Right. Sign off.